This game really could be a Slay the Spire killer. Not that it necessarily needs killing, but if you don't watch any more of this video and you're a card game fan, digital or otherwise, grab a copy of Wild Frost as soon as it comes out. It is an absolutely gorgeous, perfectly constructed, and incredibly charming roguelike deck builder that introduces some really fun new dynamics to the sometimes tired formula that Slay the Spire brought to prominence. But for those that are sticking around, I'm Wheels from Dicebreaker, like and subscribe, and this is Wild Frost. The sun has frozen over and the world has succumbed to the Wild Frost. The town of Snowdwell and its survivors stand as the last bastion against an eternal winter. In Wild Frost, you and your ragtag bunch of companions are battling against the frozen wastes and the dangerous but adorable creatures that stalk it, attempting to break the sun free from its frozen crystalline form and return the world to its original, far more habitable state. To do that, you'll be combining three genres that have become absolute staples in indie video games. Deck building, roguelites, and more importantly, turn-based tactical combat. At the core of Wild Frost's gameplay is a really interesting and fresh new take on turn-based combat, especially so in the realm of digital card games. Unlike with Slay the Spire's single heroes, scaling the tower on their lonesome, Wild Frost is a game about building a squad. Every unit in the game, including ones you'll summon from your deck of cards, is a permanent presence on the battlefield, like you might see in games like Magic the Gathering with health, attack values, and special powers. On top of that though, they also have a little sundial counter on the bottom of their card that tells you how many turns it'll take for them to activate. When a unit activates, it'll deal damage to what's in front of it and trigger any special effects that they have assigned to them like dishing out mushroom-based poisons, attacking an entire row of units, or buffing and debuffing allies and enemies, respectively. Whenever you play a card, every unit's timer ticks down, eventually reaching zero when they activate. This is a really interesting system for a few reasons. First of all, you've got a really clear and predictive way of viewing how a battle is going to play out. You know when certain high-danger enemies are going to trigger, and how much time you have to try and deal with them. You've also got a fun way for the designers to balance their cards, with dangerous units having a large cooldown on their abilities and vice versa. The second reason it's such a great mechanic is because of all the ways in which the player can interact with it. One of the first tricks that you're taught in the tutorial is using snow effects to freeze enemy timers, giving some precious few turns to prepare a strategy. You can also freely move your units around the battlefield each turn, between the two separate lanes that divide the conflict. Using that opportunity, you can shift tanky units up to the front to soak up damage, or slide precious allies to the other row to narrowly avoid a hail of barrage fire. This really fluid system makes Slay the Spire's give and take turns seem quite simple and limiting in comparison. All of a sudden it begs more comparison to things like Darkest Dungeon and Into the Breach. Turns in Wild Frost are an ever-shifting puzzle of steadily dwindling time in which you'll need to put out fires and take calculated risks to survive. It's a tight and frenetic battle of crowd control and synergy that will have both strategy gamers and car constructors alike drooling at the concept. Speaking of car construction, I was really impressed with the breadth of tactics to match Wildfire's already established depth. Three different factions will steadily unlock as you play, each with their own approach to combat. The Snow Dwellers are your base faction, and with them comes a wide variety of effects to dip your toes into. The aforementioned Snow will freeze enemy counters, bury units and weapons can heal your allies, and Spicy will buff the damage of your unit's next attacks, while Shrooms can fill your enemies with poison that damages them more with every turn. The Shade Monsters are summoners, using powerful sprite summon cards that are expendable units, each with their own special effects that can be spawned onto either the friendly or foe sides of the battlefield, providing both cannon fodder and gum to stick up the gears of your quarry's engine. And then lastly, the Clunk Masters, crafty gnomes that utilize gadgets and gizmos to flood the board with shields and turrets that can take a real beating before going down. 
they'll need to manage a resource called junk to both play and maintain their clunkers whilst being careful not to fill their deck with useless cards. And that's just the factions. After your first defeat, you'll be transported back to the town of Snowdwell where all sorts of upgrades and unlocks await you. The pet hut hosts a variety of animal companions that you can start each run with. The workshop will provide new clunkers to test out in combat. The hot springs will attract new allies to join your cause. There's new shops to unlock that you'll find on runs, new charms that you can attach to your cards as upgrades, and daily runs to take on to pit your skills against the community. Wild Frost is absolutely bursting with new things to discover and experiment with, and its perfect pacing has you coming back over and over again for another run at the Eye of the Storm. It feels like I've only just scratched the surface of what there is on offer, and the game's not even out yet. Speaking of pacing, this is not a slow and drudging turn-based game like some might assume just from the genre. Every fight feels like a boss fight, and there's always so much at stake in every turn. It can get pretty intense trying to claw yourself back from a big blow, but the runs are so rapid and things get moving so quickly that another attempt is never too much of a burden, and a quick and painful loss doesn't feel like you've just wasted an hour of your life for it all to come crashing down. The sprawling maps of Slay the Spire are heavily truncated to small and important dilemmas that will have instant repercussions on your game. Should I grab another follower or pick up some much needed gold for the inevitable shop coming up after this fight? Nothing in this game feels unimportant. Your decisions will have a lot of weight in combat too. Those companions that you'll steadily fill out your deck with have a limit to what they can provide. First of all, this isn't Hearthstone. You've got a limit to the amount of companions that you can have in each run, which can only be slightly expanded through boss battle rewards. Second of all, look after your companions because if they die in combat, they don't just get popped into your discard pile ready to jump back out in a later round. They're gone for the rest of the battle. You can intentionally discard them for a little bit of health, but making the decision to stick or twist with an injured ally can sometimes be a game-ending choice. When one of your companions does get defeated in battle, they will come back into your deck after a victory, but be warned that they'll be injured for the next fight. They'll start with reduced health and damage, and getting defeated in two fights in a row will have them permanently removed from your deck for the rest of the run. There's loads of ways to customize your characters as you play though, with charms that you can attach to your cards to add special effects and boons, different combinations of squad mates which can ape off each other's abilities, and a substitute system that allows you to place units in reserve to either swap in a more useful ally for the fight ahead, or just rest injured fighters. The most important unit on the board though is of course your own, because your character will be represented in all fights and cannot leave the battlefield. You're the leader, and whilst you can have some pretty strong abilities allowing you to give more than your fair contribution to combat, a leader falling in battle is the end of a run, sending you back to square one. There's just so many wonderful little systems in Wild Frost that has every turn feeling like a nail-biting decision or a really rewarding payoff. With hundreds of different combinations of abilities and cards, and loads of ways to approach the same challenge in a different way, the replayability has me coming back for more and more. This could definitely be my new hyperfixation for the foreseeable future, as it has its iron claws in me quite tightly at the moment, and I'm also really excited to see how this game is supported post-launch, with new daily runs, and hopefully a healthy smattering of additional content, paid or otherwise. For now, the message is very clear. Buy the hell out of this game. It's a masterclass in refreshing what has become, to some, a slightly tired genre, and it's wrapped up in some of the most gorgeous presentation I've seen in a long, long time. Retailing for about £17 or $20 US dollars, and available on both PC and Nintendo Switch from April 12th, it really is a no-brainer in my eyes and has my fullest recommendation. I can't wait to delve even deeper into the storm and see what awaits me there.
Thanks so much for watching this review of Wild Frost, and thanks to Chucklefish for sending over a free code for this review. If you've liked what you've seen, then please do stick around here on Dicebreaker, where we have all sorts of tabletop recommendations, including a list of some of our favorite digital card games in both video and written form, which are both linked on the end slate that you're watching right now. Hit subscribe, give us a like and a comment below, and we'll see you on the next one. But until then, thanks very much for watching, and have a lovely day.